It is just an honor today to bring back to the show Deborah Carrier, RDH. You'll remember her from episode 824. I can't believe that was two years ago. And now she's back with Dr. Kwan Wanson DDS, the CEO of Care Mobile. Uh, let me read their bios again. We'll go ladies first, Quan. Sorry about that. In um, 2015, Deborah Carrier, RDH, developed and patented temperature regulating, moisture wicking, antimicrobial uniforms, and founded twice as nice uniforms. In addition to her many years working as a dental hygienist, she was also a high fashion model. She took her experience and love of fashion in New York City, where she worked with and learned from industry experts about fabrics, fit, and manufacturing before setting out to create a new stylish, technologically advanced approach to medical and dental apparel that is safe, professional, and comfortable. Recently, she has established the company as a niche, high-end dental apparel company and launched a new program, Twice a Life, to donate gently used uniforms to dental mission trips. Two current partnerships have allowed her company to grow and remain manufacturing in the U.S. She has partnered with her factory of four years in New Jersey and is also a key opinion leader with Procter & Gamble Crest Oral-B, um, who I saw announced today they're starting to use reusable, um, recyclable tubes. So we'll talk about that later. To present fashion shows nationwide to the dental industry. Another very important partnership is with Care Mobile, producing the SAM Radiation Protectant Dental Jacket. Deborah has been featured in RDH Magazine, Dentistry Today, Dental Explorer, Atlanta Best Self, DEW, and winner of Apparel Magazine's Most Innovative Company of 2015. She is a member of the Crest Smile Council and has participated in various podcast seminars and fashion shows over the past two years. Deborah's goal with twice as nice uniforms is bringing comfort to those who comfort others. She strives to make the daily life of her fellow healthcare providers more comfortable and safer by providing high quality temperature regulating protective professional looking uniforms and you can also see her on my gosh uh, Dr. Phil um, that show The Doctors uh, you've been on five times so she is a uh, flat out movie star and the other uh <laughs> handsome fella that looks like he could easily be a movie star is Dr. Quan, think of Swan, like Quan like Swan, Dr. Wants, but I, I want to think of Quan like uh, Larry, uh, Larry Swan. Uh, was that his name in the 49ers? Uh, Lynn Swan. Lynn Swan. Oh my God. That guy. I, I don't, I don't think his body was affected by gravity. Uh, that's a, uh, he had an anti-gravity body, but Dr. Quan, Watson, DDS, is the CEO of Care Mobile Inc., an innovation company with a focus on providing comprehensive oral health care in single operatory mobile dental units. He's a 1999 University of Kentucky College dental graduate with the degree of Doctor of Medical Dentistry. He purchased his first practice a year after graduation. The practice tripled in revenue in less than five years and was the largest dental practice in West Louisville, pronounced Louisville. I, uh, I, I, I lived there a summer. Um, um, I, I spent a whole summer in Louisville. In 2007, he started a high-end de novo practice in Norton Commons, but soon realized his passion was serving the working class and underserved population. He sold both practices and in 2016 took a role as state dental director for Community Dental of Kentucky. In this position, he traveled the state training doctors and providing care to those with limited oral health care options. With 21 years of dental experience and as a serial entrepreneur with expertise in logistics, franchising, and real estate, Dr. Watson's goals are to inspire and provide individual providers the opportunity to obtain affordable practice ownership and increase access to comprehensive oral health care for all. He has served as a consultant for industry leaders in mobile dentistry. He is president of the Kentucky Dental Society, the president of the American Mobile Dental Alliance, and dental director for DentaQuest and Anthem for the state of Kentucky. My God, well, first of all, I got to figure out how did you two meet? Because one's in Kentucky, <laughs> one's in Georgia. How long would it take you to get in a car in Louisville and drive to Georgia? How long a drive would that be? Uh, it's only six hours. It's not that okay, far. Okay, six hours. But that's not how we met. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not that far. You met yeah, on The Apprentice, The Doctor Show. <laughs> yeah, were, right. were you the guest on Dr. Phil? <laughs> right. uh, you were leaving when she was coming on? We were on Maury Povich. 
<laughs> no, um, what happened was we met through a mutual friend who's also a yeah. dental entrepreneur and Quan was talking to him and said he had an idea for this radiation protective jacket. And he said, I have the idea, but I don't really want to go into the uniform company. And he said, I know exactly who you need to talk to. You need to talk with Deborah. So we got connected that way. And then by just crazy happenstance, I was on the phone talking to Quan and I said, well, let's try to, you know, get together over the next few weeks. I'm in Washington right now. And he said, I'm in Washington right now. And we were in the same building in Washington, D.C. So we ended up meeting that day and the rest is history. What, was that at a dental convention? Yes. Uh -huh. oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. Which one? NDA? Uh -huh. yeah. National Dental Association? Mm -hmm. Correct. My yeah. God. When I, when I spoke for them, uh, that was so long ago. I think when I spoke for them, the Dead Sea was just sick at that time. Uh, <laughs> I think that was uh, 30 years ago. How? Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I, I know I spoke for him in the 90s a couple of times. I, I can still remember. Um, but um, my gosh, I don't even know where to start. We got a we got a, a movie star, a <laughs> hygienist who's uh, well. She's already been on the show. So, Quan, let's start with you. Um, why did you start Care Mobile? Wow. So, as I said, I've been a dentist for 21 years. Um, I enjoyed and love practicing dentistry. Um, when I sold both of my practice because my business partner was ready to retire, I started working for another company and I realized how much I enjoyed having my own practice that I owned and operated, but I didn't want to go in the amount of debt that it took to start my third practice again in my mid forties. And so I had a van that I was using for another a business, put a chair in there and I said, I'll just go around and just see the people I want to see. And in the process of doing so, I was like, hmm, this is really working. I think I was seeing about 40 to 50 new patients a month. Um, I had cut all these, 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 these expenses and overhead. I had one assistant, so I cut my staffing. I was outsourcing, you know, call center and stuff like that. I'm like, man, why wouldn't other dentists want to do this? You know, it, it's cheaper uh, to do. Uh, I don't have to worry about legit, uh, location being a barrier. And so we then started creating the model and figuring out a way to market it for other people to be able to mimic what we've done with care. So that's how I got into it. And um, mobile dentistry, I mean, uh, I, I can remember going back to conventions 30 years ago where they were bringing in uh, uh, mobile homes. One time at the ADA convention, one was the size of like a semi-trailer, had like six chairs. So it always seems like it's it's going to, going to, going to take off. But it, it, it's really never uh, exploded. Do you, do you think uh, the pandemic might change that as more and more people uh, don't want to go in, uh, in a room with a bunch of other people that might be super spreaders? Well, well the time is definitely now. Um, you know, our model has always been a one chair dental practice. And for a lot of people in the industry, they're like, well, one chair, that doesn't make sense. Why would you just have one chair? And for me, it was about reducing the cost to create the vans, right? Those big vans cost a lot of money. The bigger the van, you have to hire somebody to actually drive the van, which is adding expenses. And so I'm like, you know, having a single operatory uh, mobile unit where I can park it in my driveway when I'm not using it, where my assistant can drive it if I choose to, um, is a lot easier way. And if I'm going to see multiple people, um, it's more cost effective for me to build two vans and go to that one location and just hop back and forth between the two vans, as opposed to having one van with multiple chairs. And you're hundred percent right. Since COVID interest in our model has grown exponentially. Um, you know, no one wants to be in a two chair mobile dental van anyway, at this particular period of time. But the biggest difference between us and other people on the market is that we're doing comprehensive care. So, I mean, I'm going to people's homes and doing everything from their root canals right in the driveway. Um, dentures, partial. I did a denture case earlier today, Invisalign, you name it, we do it right there. And so it's more about um, doing comprehensive dental care in a way where your overhead cost is a lot less. So um, what are uh, a kidnapper's favorite shoes? I have no idea. <laughs> Bands. Bands. Yeah. Yeah, remember, remember when we grew up, it was always rose or red, yeah. violets or blue. I'd get in the van if I were you. So every everybody's been told never to ever go get in the van. Do 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 kids stop at the van and say, "Hey, 
My mom told me never get into the van with a stranger. Um, how do the how do the patients uh, see this? Do they are they, they thinking of the conv- they, they love it? We'll talk talk about that. Why it. why do they love it? Are they less less Man. mobile or? They love it because we're coming to them. There's nothing like not having to wait in the waiting room for hours. You can be at home, especially during this time of social dis- distancing, watching Netflix. Um, we call you when we're in route. Our routes are pre-scheduled in advance, so we know what we're gonna where we're going on each day. Um, we arrive there. You hop into the van right out the driveway. You only have to deal with one other person. We're already PPE'd up. We've added safety features to the van to make sure it's the safest way to provide dental services, especially in this COVID environment. We provide excellent care, and you get to know your doctor again. And one of the reasons that I really like the model more than anything is that I don't have to see 15, 20 patients a day to make comparable money, and I get to spend more time with my patients. And I miss that aspect of things where when I first started practicing, I knew all my patients. I knew their names. I knew everything about them. In the last 10 years, because it's like, assembly line, especially if you're working in more of a working class practice. Um, I had an eight operatory practice. I mean, I didn't know my patients anymore. And so I, I get to get back to knowing my patients. And this, you learn so much when you go to where someone lives about them and about their environment. And for a lot of people, they're a lot more comfortable in their own environment than they are going into a dental practice. So, And, and then when you walk in the kitchen and all you see is Coke and candy and lollipops <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, you, you get a better idea on if they're telling you if they're eating lean and mean and clean. We don't we don't go in anyone's house. That's that's our number one rule. Um, we stay in the van. We call you from the van. You come out to the van and get all the services done in the van. So our vans are similar to like Amazon Prime Sprinter vans, and uh, they're like a Mercedes Sprinter van. And we have nice, cool um, inverter systems, so um, they're very energy efficient. And you press a button, everything comes on. We do what we need to do. We take so that, all your that's a, Mer- that's a Mercedes van. We use Mercedes, of course. If we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. Use what, Mercedes. what type of um, what type of van did you say? Mercedes van? What was it? It's, it's a Sprinter van. We usually use either the 144 or the 170 wheelbase. And what does something like that? Um, what does something like that cost? So, so our entire package. Um, if you're a doctor or a hygienist looking to um, be involved. It's a hundred fifty thousand dollar package, and for that, we give you all your initial equipment, all your initial supplies, six months of consultations with me and my team to learn all of our systems and processes. You ask, how do we get patients? Uh, we let our patients organically um, help us market it, and uh, my Facebook following is pretty pretty huge because I usually take pictures with my patients afterward. They post it. Everybody thinks it's cool and new and and innovative and the growth potential is, is crazy. By so, doing it that way. so you, um, is it like a franchise then if someone wanted to do this? Do the, they... It's a licensing opportunity. So, you know, we really don't, it's not a franchise. It's a licensing opportunity. So you have autonomy, but we just tell you, you know, I've learned so much for in the last two and a half years, uh, on, you know, on processes and systems on how to do this efficiently and effectively. And so it's white label. You call it whatever, whatever you want. If you're Dr. Smith, call it Dr. Smith's Mobile Dentistry. If this, if you have a brick and mortar practice, it's a great adjunct to your brick and mortar practice to go out there before you spend half a million dollars plus on a new location, get a mobile unit and go out there and, and grow that, that patient base in that area first and then set up a brick and mortar practice. You know, when I started my second practice, I thought it was like, just knew it all because my first practice went so well so quickly. And then I started my second practice in the re- in, in the beginning of a recession of 07, 08 in, a, in the higher rent district and realized I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. And so, you know, by being more um, careful and specific and making sure that you're not like spending all this money hoping you're going to be able to be successful in that next location is a great way to do it. Mobile. So... So it's not a fr- so how much did you say it costs to do the program? Yes, yeah, 150,000 and that gets you the Mercedes corner van totally decked out with a single chair and all your initial equipment and supplies needed to do comprehensive dental care if you're a dentist and that even includes 6 months of consultation with me. So uh, and my team. So as soon as you sign the and get the funding, we start helping you work through credentialing because we take regular insurance we, we have a 75-page reference manual that lines out all of our systems, our processes, how we market, 
Um, we can help you with optimization on your landing page. I mean, everything you need to be successful in your own prospective market. We try to help you do that. And for financing purposes, um, you know, um, you know, you, you got an asset. I mean, it's a lot easier to get a loan for a house or a car because um, the bank can re repo it. You can't repo 25, you know, crowns and bridges and implants. You can't repo anything in dentistry. So it should be fairly easy for a young dental student who graduated $400,000 in debt to get a $150,000 loan because part of that loan is a recoverable asset of a Mercedes Benz van sprinter. Correct. And, you know, the majority of the um, investment is the equipment and supplies. Of that, we're only charging roughly about 25000 on the consulting side for the six months. So, you know, all of that, of course, we're able to quantify for your lender to make it, you know, easy for you to get that loan if you're looking at this as a, as a way to get into business for yourself. Um, you know, I missed, you know, I started my first practice or purchased my first practice a year after graduation. A lot of doctors aren't doing that anymore. Um, and a lot of it's because of how much student loan debt they come out of school with. And, um, you know, that's a huge barrier. And I think it's a, a huge issue for um, populations that want to have that one-on-one -on -one care and not have a different doctor every time they go into some of the corporate groups or, you know, just want to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with their doctor again. And and how long have you been doing this? I've been doing it now for two and a half years. So, you know, we, we, we were doing this before COVID and then COVID hit. And now all of a sudden, you know, people are like, well, that's a pretty good idea, you know, that, that you came up with, you know, thinking that I just started it around COVID when, you know, the friend that introduced Deborah and I is actually a mouthwash, uh, Branch. And so I've, I've been using Branch product. For two years on the van because we use it to help us be more efficient and effective. But before teledentistry was like a necessary thing to do. So we've come up with a lot of solutions in the dental space and a lot of different technologies like the jacket that Deborah and I partner with and some software, cool software that helps you with the logistics side of things to make it where it's truly a turnkey solution for dentists and hygienists uh, to get into business for themselves. So it says on your website, so you go to care, K-A-R-E, uh, dot Mobi, M-O-B-I. I didn't even know Mobi was a um, uh, a domain. Uh, I know, right? But it fits. It is, yeah, it, it is, does. It so what, what was Mobi originally for? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, so care, Mobi. Because um, uh, they have one dental too, but I, I love that care. So a play on the word C-A-R-E, care, K-A-R-E, dot Mobi. That is cool. But on your website, it says um, a safe and mobile radiation resistant technology. Sam is here. We are taking pre-orders for safe and mobile radiation resistant personal protective equipment for anyone in direct contact to radiation exposure when taking x-rays in healthcare. Annual mm -hmm. occupation dose limits are between 20 and 50 MSV. We tested this product with two and a half times that exposure limit with less than 1% penetration. Total weight is a pound and a half. Um, compared to a seven pound lead apron as twice as nice and care mobile collaboration, our lab coat meets and exceeds all OSHA requirements for personal protective equipment protection. Our product is registered with the FDA. So, so what was going on? What's different about a van versus an office where a, um, a, a safe and mobile, uh, radiation resistant PPE was uh, necessary. Yeah. Well, first our product is good for both the office and the van but just think just think about it. you're in an enclosed space right an enclosed 60 square foot tin can and you're you're taking x-rays in it and you're not able to get around a wall to protect yourself and those x-rays are bouncing off the walls and and um the law or the regulation in kentucky is that if you don't have a lead if you're taking x-rays in that capacity you're supposed to wear a lead apron and so it's the assistant and, you know, seven pound lead apron is front loaded. It's awkward. It's in the summer. It's kind of heavy and hot to wear. And once again, we're doing root canals and everything. So that means I would have to wear that during the entire procedure. And I was like, man, is there anything out there on the market that would be lighter in weight? And so the regulation says that it has to be lead based or lead equivalent material to provide the protection. So I was looking for a product to purchase that would meet those standards so that I wouldn't have to wear this lead apron every time I, I took an x-ray. Didn't see anything out there. So called the old patent attorney up. He couldn't find anything equivalent. Started testing different materials to use um, to provide the protection. 
was able to find a product. Built my mama was a homemade teacher. She sewed the, the prototype together herself. Um, we tested it, um, met Deborah, saw, met, loved her product, and it's like, hey, you know, can we partner up? You know, I got this great idea. I filed the provisional patent on. Um, love your uh, apparel and your your scrubs, and we just hit it off. And you know, we we she created a bomb product that uh, I love wearing, and I love um, of, of being a part of of our partnership. So. You know, the thing I used to do with my uh, boys is um, that old trick where on uh, the first of the year, you have all your hangers uh, pointing to you and your shoes pointing to you. And then when you wear it throughout the year, um, you face it the other way. And it's amazing how at the end of the year, you you know, the, the, with my four boys raised them, they, they, didn't, they didn't wear half their stuff. And there's something about clothes where, you know, a kid walks in his room, he's going to go to school, and he's got all these shirts and pants, but he always passes on these certain shirts, and he always gets this one. Um, mm-hmm. And um, clothes really does affect your psychology. In fact, on your website, Karamobi, um, when you're trying on that jacket, you look like you're uh, Batman and you're smiling so big. It, it looks like you're, you're, you're just having fun. I mean, clothes really can affect your mood, can it? Hey, it, you know, it makes your style. It makes you who you are. Like, people love the jacket. They, 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 they usually say, um, what's the, the Matrix? Yeah, I've, I've been it's like the Matrix. Oh, Reeves. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of times. Yeah. And, and, and uh, oh, my gosh. Um, but, um. So that that is just amazing. Um. So um. Is, is, so the jacket is the big part that you're doing with Deborah. It is. So that's our partnership. Um. You know the care side and, and the bands and all the things that we created on that is between me and and, and and my business partners. Um. The jacket is a business that uh, Deborah and I are partnered up on to promote uh, throughout the dental industry. We don't want it just to be for the bands. We think that. You know, the exposure to radiation for life, if you're pregnant, a, a pregnant assistant, you know, it's even less. So like the occupational limits of, is over, I think it's 10% of what it would be normally. And so just having that assistant wear this jacket when she's walking around, especially a lot of these open operatory uh, practices, is why not? You know, um, it, it's just added protection. And I think it's important to protect ourselves, especially in this day and time. And this isn't a jacket that everybody in the office has to have, but if you have at least a couple in every office, I'm, I'm hearing from so many offices that they either have people that are pregnant, people are trying to get pregnant, or, you know, just we all think now with digital x-rays that we're safer. And we are, except we all know that radiation is cumulative and it's still, we're still getting it. I mean, if you don't line it up exactly right, you're still going to get some of that scattered radiation. So it's, by making it look like a regular jacket and making it comfortable, then, you know, it's not really like you're hauling around a lead apron. And the other cool thing about it is we took the radiation protective fabric around over your shoulders, back to your shoulder blades. So it also becomes an ergonomic jacket because it forces you to sit up straight or stand up straight, which we all have that problem in dentistry. So it's comfortable and it's, you know, and it's safe at the same time. So, you know, the thyroid, the thyroid never. Oh, yeah. And then it has a removable thyroid collar as well. So it, it just snaps on and off. Um, so you could take that off. And then, you know, like Dr. Watson, he wears it all day long, but he can put it on when he's actually taking the x ray or just unsnap it and let it hang to the side. Yeah. It's beautiful. Now, Deborah, is a lot of these, um, was the reason that you got interested in this because you live in a van down by the river? Uh, <laughs> Was, was no, that you or Chris Farley? It was, <laughs> it was you or Chris Farley. One of, one of you two lived right. in a van down by the river. Uh, but, no, um, I got interested because I'm super passionate about dressing professionally and dressing comfortably and dressing safely. And this just fit all the criteria. When I met Dr. Watson, I was like, uh, we have to do this. I have to do this for my dental people. And it goes way beyond mm-hmm. dentistry. I mean, there anybody that uses radiation. Um, you know, medicine, veterinary, um, anybody. And a lot of people in pediatrics, they stay in the room when they're taking x-rays. So um, there's a lot of people out there that we, we need to protect. So are you uh, Sherlock Holmes and then he's Watson? <laughs> or, no, uh, yeah. <laughs> which, which one's Holmes and which one's Watson? Um, 
But you know, I don't know. I, 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 I'm definitely I, Watson. <laughs> you're, you're Watson. <laughs> I, I, I remember uh, in Catholic school, there was, uh, you know, I was in Catholic school from, uh, you know, kindergarten to the end of Creighton, and um, it was all uniforms. And there were two types of, of people in, in every year. You know, half the kids like me loved it because you didn't have to wake up and think. I mean, I had four pairs of pants and four pastel color shirts with it. My mom sewed them all. And then there was that artsy crowd where they just hated their uniform. It was the worst thing in the world. Um, I love dentistry because I get out in the morning and I get to put on a uniform again. I don't have to think about, does this match that and all this crap like that? Um, But I do notice uh, from my experience that, that, you know, half the people like a uniform, the other half don't, but man, it really does affect their mood. They, they, if you don't like the what you're wearing or how it looks, or, and and I, I remember, um, you know, doing this with the, the kids where, you know, they would say it, it doesn't match, and you're just sitting there thinking, what the hell is he saying? You know, what, what how, how can that not match? But it's very, very important to visual animals like humans that they, they, li- they want to look, they want to like the way they look, Right. In the mirror, it's a, it really impacts them to a big extent. Yeah, I have a, a quick story of when I first got out of college and I was working in a big group practice in Chicago and um, there were four other hygienists working there and they all had a lot more experience than I had. And after six months of working there, I noticed that all the patients were asking to be put on my schedule. And I couldn't figure out why, because I knew these other hygienists, you know, had more experience than me. They were probably better hygienists than I was. But our doctor, every month, he would give us these goofy little awards. And every month I got the best dressed award. And I started looking around the office at what the other hygienists were wearing. And I thought, you know, I look like I know what I'm doing. I look more professional than these other hygienists look. And, you know, that says a lot to your patients. Your patients really, you know, they respect you. And there are studies that, that are out there that, that show that as well. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a bit confusing. There's a lot of graduates, um, 6,000 a year, and they, they come out and there's, um, they hear mixed things, but... Some some say um, you should dress for success and and um, have whatever look you want. Then others say no, you should look like a doctor and you should wear you know the scrubs and the the white thing. And then other people think, well, um, I don't feel good like that. I want to wear you know I, I want to wear you know what I would wear on uh, whatever and and then just put a lab coat on. But when you say dress for success and you're a healthcare provider, and we sell the invisible. I mean, when I go to the store and buy a bottle of water or an iPhone, you know exactly what you're buying. But when um, you look at me and say, you have four cavities, um, I, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. I, I, only, I can only trust you. And it's very, very difficult in any business where you sell the invisible um, because it's all based on trust and it's all based on trust and presentation and all that stuff. So if you were coaching dentists and hygienists to uh, sell the invisible, what is what is the look to come off like? Yeah, he's professional. I believe I believe him when he says I have four cavities. And I trust them that I'm going to let them do that. What, what, what should be going through your head? Personally, I think everybody should be in scrubs and a lab coat or now even an isolation gown, you know, and, and especially now you need to keep up with all your PPE with COVID and you know, what all the guidelines are. But the biggest thing is you got to look put together and you got to look clean. And we got, we went through a phase where scrubs were like wrinkled pajamas and those are horrible and they fade and they stain and people would just keep wearing them to work. And you cannot sit there and try to sell a $50,000 implant case to a patient when you look like you just rolled out of bed and you spilled your lunch all over the front of your scrubs. So to me, you need to be polished and, you know, wear scrubs that don't wrinkle and don't fade and, and wear a lab coat that makes you look, you know, together. Juan, what do you want to add to that? Uh, you know, you, you can't be partnered with Twice as Night's uniform and not promote the brand. So, of course, I'm decked out in my Twice as Night's uniform scrubs when I work, and, and I agree 100%. Uh, her, her scrubs don't wrinkle, um, they don't fade, and I feel like I consistently look the part. You know, there's two stories that 
that really uh, shook me to the core going that I'll never forget going back to uh, when I started in 87 is um, um, I had a woman associate. And one time she went to give a shot and an old man who's about as old as me is now gr- grabbed her wrist as she's going to get a shot. And he said, shouldn't the doctor do that? And I thought to myself, well, what if you were laying in a hospital bed and some guy came in with a tool belt on and he had, you know, drills and pliers and screwdrivers and he started and started to start an IV on you. You, you would think, <laughs> why is the maintenance man doing an IV on me? Yeah. And I thought to myself, that is not his fault because at first everybody's mad at this dumb old man. I thought, well, he he's a dumb old man. I mean, if and I said this day forward, the receptionist, the hygienist, the dentist and the assistants are going to have four different looks. I mean, the, we are no duplicating. You should be able to walk in there and say, that is a doctor, that's a hygienist, that's an assistant. And that was a, a really good thing. And then the other thing I realized how lucky it was, um, when I got, you know, I lost my, I, started, I, I went bald senior high school. And so when I opened my dental office, I was 24 and I was really paranoid that, you know, you're, you're 24, you're a kid, you're a baby, who's going to trust you? And there were these, yeah, you know, there was like four or five older dentists across the street that were far better than me. They were more experienced. They were just, you know, I, I'd have them fix my teeth. And I was always getting second opinions from them. And they'd always say, well, I'd rather you do it because those guys, they're, they're so young and they look like babies. <laughs> and these guys were five years older than me with a bunch of hair. And here I was a cue ball, and they're like, they just assumed I was an, an old man. And I thought, wow, this bald head really um, sells old older age, experience, whatever. And and you know how when you um, get older, you know, like when you go into a dental school class, I mean, you almost like gasp at how young these students are. You're like, oh, my God, what is this, a daycare center? And uh, and you're like, and you just want to check, like, so you went to, you already went to college and undergrad? And they're like, yes, I'm, I'm 22. And you're just like, <laughs> oh, my gosh. So now that I'm at this end, it's like, what advice would you give to a 24-year-old baby that walks out of dental school and looks like they're not old enough to listen to a Justin Bieber song, uh, let alone uh, do a root canal? What, what advice would you give them to look more experienced and trustworthy and and someone you'd want to uh, let work on you. That's exactly what you have to do. You have to dress like the dental professional that you are. You're highly educated. You're highly talented. You've got to dress that part. Put on a lab coat. Get it in gray, or gray, get it embroidered with your name and your credentials. And stay looking put together and starched. And going back to what you were saying before about I'm one of those artsy people. And when I dress, I like to have my statement pieces that, you know, that I'm who I am. So when I'm in a an office with a bunch of people that have scrubs on just like me there's other ways to stand out and I know like you Dr. Fran you used to or I don't know if you still do but don't you wear crazy shoes like different kind of tennis shoes like wild looking right, tennis shoes yeah right so that's a way to express yourself and I make um, surgical caps that have all different kinds of colors and you know different patterns on them and stuff so there's different ways that you can add little touches to your to your uniforms but everybody still look you know, polished and professional. Well, wow, you're the only person on earth that ever noticed uh, my 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 uh, shoes uh, that I've ever talked to outside my office. But I got to tell you a story about that. Is um, you know, as you get older, um, your your feet would be t- sore at the end of the day. You know, I I never felt that in your 20s and the 30s, but now I'm 58 and you stand all day. And so it was about five years ago where um, I I went to a podiatrist and he said um all the sh- all the shoes are junk except for uh, New Balance and Asics. And he said, what I would do, he said, just wear those. And um, so I went, and all the Asics tennis shoes looked like they were all designed at an LSD party in San Francisco. I mean, they're all orange and purples and reds. and But they were so comfortable. And my feet didn't hurt at the end of the day, but it was so funny because all the runners, all the athletes, everybody – knows what an A6 pair of tennis shoes looks like from across the room, all the bright. It was always a conversation piece, and that was, um, I started doing that when I did uh, the three Arizona, I did the Arizona Ironman three years in a row, and um, um, in fact, the greatest part about the pandemic is that they had to cancel the Arizona Ironman, and I, I, 
I wrote the rhythm letter, said, I think it should be a permanent ban. I never want to be tempted to have to do this damn thing again. It was so horrible uh, three times. But, um, yeah, I mean, shoes are a big deal. And I that's why I grew up with five sisters. And I feel sorry for them because I see so many women dentists and they're sporting these high heels and it's like, dude, you're you're 24. You can't do that when you're 44 or 54 or 64. And then my podiatrist told me when I was talking to him about that, he said that 80% of his patients are women from wearing high-heeled shoes their whole life, whereas men, when you have a flat shoe, half your weight's on your heel, half's on the ball of your foot. But he said women, it's double bad because they lift up their back foot and then they pull in their pointy toes and um, so what would you say, uh, Deborah, on the shoes? I think anything that you're comfortable in, as long as they're clean and, you know, look nice and they're not old, you know, like ratty tennis shoes. I think it's whatever you feel the most comfortable in because you, you're but the one that's got to walk. Were, if you were um, high heels all I don't even know if it's high heels, but just I guess any heel. But if you were heels all day. Um, are your feet significantly more sore at the end of the day than if you wore, say, well, tennis shoes? Mine are because I don't wear them all the time. But I know women who wear high heels all the time and they're more comfortable in them. So it's that's just kind of, you know, up to them, you know, what they want to do with that, I think. I, I switched to the New Balance about two or three years ago myself. <laughs> my feet started. <laughs> so what happened? You turned 40 and had to switch to New Balance? Is that what? Is that how the story goes? I did. That's pretty much the story. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's uh it's just a huge difference. I mean, you just I, I can't I couldn't imagine wearing anything that makes your feet sore at the end of the day. And, and there's even some tennis shoes you can get. I, I found one pair of New Balance one time that was completely black, and that was like five years ago. So it almost kind of looked like a you know, church shoes from you know 20, 30 feet away, but then I never found them again. Uh, but I'm I'm sure if I went online, there's a longer tell of inventory. So um, so Quan, who is um most you you've been doing this uh, mobile dentistry for uh, you said how many years? Three years. Three years. Mm -hmm. Three Close years. Three. And um, how how's yeah. the success going? Who's um, mostly been interested in it? Is it is it a uh, first time kids out of school? Is it older dentists? Um, who's who's been your initial uh, customers and um, who's it targeting? We've had over 250 inquiries in the last three months. And so it's been a wide array, a lot of hygienists, um, some new doctors and some existing practice owners, especially during the, the part of COVID when everyone had to shut down, uh, that were looking for other opportunities to get out there and provide services for people. So it's been a, it's been a pretty uh, broad ar array of people that have been interested in it. So it's been exciting. Um, we're looking, we're excited about some expansion in some other states next year um, and later this year with some potential licensees as well. So right now you're only in Louisville? Only in Louisville right now, um, but we have some licensees scheduled in uh, Florida and Vegas, um, Detroit. So we, we're looking to expand into other areas uh, really soon. And, and um, you said hygienist inquiry. So um, can hygienists do independent practice in Kentucky or in other states? Or? No, they can't, they, can't, they can't do independent in Kentucky, um, but they can, um, in some states, hygienists can own their own practices, state-specific. Um, and so we've had some inquiries from hygienists in states where they can uh, either work independently or do so in collaboration with dentists. And sometimes, if a hygienist is interested, we can go out and try to help them find a dentist that will be their partner in dentist in that perspective community. And to me, to me, that's one of the most embarrassing things about dentists. When I when I hear these dentists talking about the United States and freedom and liberty and justice for all, I'm like, dude, you give money to attorneys at the ADA that make it illegal for them to own their own business. And I really deep down inside wish that you lost your U.S. citizenship and had to go back and apply. I mean, I just cannot believe. I mean, humans can rationalize anything. I mean, if you if you said, well, what's the difference between a human and all the other animals? All the other animals live in the present. I mean, when that zebra is eating, he's looking at the lion, the tiger, the water. I mean, he's always in the present. But for us to be aware of our own existence, we have to leave the present 
and they spend half the time in some fantasy Wally world that doesn't even make sense. And in and in Colorado, where they legalize high genestone in their own practice, I think I've met almost all of them, and they're all in small towns under a thousand. Um, they all just use the when you walk in their house, that first room to the side. Um, they they took out that dining room table, which is a joke anyway. I mean, whenever you see a china closet, it's a museum for dishes that have never been used. Uh, if you want to hide anything uh, from anyone in the house, you always put it in the oven. No one knows. No one ever looks in the oven, and, and they, they put an old dental chair there. And their neighbors come by, and they pay in cash. They're not using dentrix or software you know they pay 80 100 bucks whatever they would to get their hair and nails done and then if she sees something concerning she writes a little note and gives it to referral and those doctors in the seminar were like oh yeah i'm like um one hour down the road from her and we love her because she's already cleaned their teeth she saw something was wrong she comes in and and, and then and then to hear all these dentists who are so proud to be an american while they've taken away the right for this hygienist to own her own business. And it's just so, it, it's just nauseatingly disgusting. And now they're doing it again with dental therapists. It's like they, they show them, okay, there's areas in Alaska that are bigger than the state of Rhode Island with not one dentist in the area. And so we're going to train a, a dental therapist to get on a snowmobile and drive two hours out there and help someone. And who's against it? The dentist. Yeah. It's yeah, like, I, I it's agree. so, it's just gross. I mean, uh, the I only way you can get better is competition. I mean, what would the NFL be if you got rid of the Arizona Cardinals? Uh, all the other teams are just, you know, useless. Um, but it, it's, it's, the, it's the competition of the Arizona Cardinals that makes all the other teams go to practice. And the dentists want to get rid of all the hygienists and dental therapists. But talk, talk about that for a while. Um, do you um, do you think hygiene hygienists it, going forward will be um, more likely in more states to own their own practice? Do you think independent practicer? And they're also talking about dental therapists, which is another huge controversy. Yeah, I'm I'm in fa- I'm up in favor of hygienists and dental therapists owning their own practices, especially in areas where there's a large number of underserved populations and there's no other options. I know in Kentucky in Eastern and Western Kentucky, and even in West Louisville, where I, my practice was, the number of practices has greatly diminished because profitability has greatly diminished for single practice owners uh, out there. And so why not? I mean, people need care. Um, if dentists aren't going to provide the care, why not have the hygienist um, do the preventative work and with the oversight of a dentist, especially with all the tools we out, have out here and all the technology where, you know, I can I can view x-rays without being exactly on the van. I can do synchronous teledentistry and, and, and provide adequate uh, comprehensive examinations without sitting right there um, chair side. So, yes, I'm definitely in favor of expansion and, of ideas. And, and you go to a resort and, you know, you go down the resort and, you know, your wife can do all these things. You get her hair done, nails done, massage, all that stuff. And I, I don't need my hair done, nails done. And it's like, well, can I get my teeth clean? Oh, well, that, that, that'd that be illegal. I'm like, we're on a cruise ship out in the middle of the ocean. Well, you know, it's still, you know, their license back in Miami would be in jeopardy if they were doing cleanings out in the in international water because that's how the Florida dentist, you know, in their absolute, darkest hour of paranoia that was their best idea to make sure that nobody on a carnival cruise line can get a cleaning in the middle of the pacific atlantic ocean it's it's just crazy so um more logistics do you use do you do insurance billing ppos what what is your practice management system so we use dentures to send right now but we're in the process of creating our own uh dental software because we want to create a software that will integrate all the nuances of the logistics components of the practice and automate the, the scheduling process for patients. So um, we're, we're not just a uh, van manufacturing company and a consulting company, but we also want to create the SaaS software that will aid that doctor in being the most efficient and profitable as possible in a mobile unit, especially one that's going to go to multiple locations in a day. So were you born in Louisville? No, my dad worked for GE, so I moved around. I was actually born in Arkansas, but I lived in a lot of different states. So my dad opened up um, 
he had five Sonics in Wichita, but he opened up one in Louisville, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And and on the opening crew, I was on the opening crew, so it was uh, my uh, I think it was between junior and senior year mm-hmm. or summer, whatever one of the, one of those summers. Um, I drove to um, Louisville and stayed there and uh, for the whole summer until I had to drive back and go to school. Uh, that was extremely oh, no. memorable because in Kansas, all the fields were uh, wheat fields, and it was a whole different culture. They grew tobacco, and uh, in fact, um, I, I just let it. But if you cross the border of Louisville, you're into um, Indiana, right? How far are you from the state line of Indiana? Oh, no, I'm, I'm right across the line. Five minutes. So, so <laughs> um, does, yeah. do the laws change for your business model in Indiana versus Kentucky? So we're taking each state one state at a time. If I have a licensee in that state, we'll, we'll do a deeper dive into the specifics of the law there to make sure that we're making sure that our providers and our licensees are in compliance in that particular state. So I don't have one in Indiana, so I haven't done the research in that state yet. So, you know, the, the bottom line is, you know, history always repeats itself. And I remember when Bob Barkley was flying around on an airplane trying to get dentists to adopt this new hygienist thing. And um, it was he was met with massive resistance, just like the dental therapist and everybody was against him. In fact, he died in an airplane flying to a sea. He actually died on his mission to do this. I mean, Bob Barkley was just just an amazing man and the arguments were i don't have time for a hygienist because i'm so busy pulling everyone's teeth and giving them immediate dentures and he had to sell them on well do you want your children to grow up and lose all their teeth and want immediate dentures and and it was just at a brick wall and the bottom line i wish what everybody when you're hearing all these arguments instead of thinking well a hygienist will take away my right to do a cleaning. Okay, well, you're not doing cleanings. You're extracting all their teeth and doing immediate dentures. And now this dental therapist is uh, doing fillings. Well, most dentists I know hate doing fillings. Uh, you know, I mean, when when I walk into a room and I have an upper quadrant of four MOD composites on two, three, four, and five, I'm not jumping up and down looking for my uh, fruit of the, you know, my... Uh, Cheerios. I mean, I'm just like, damn, that's that's a lot of work. I mean, to do four MOD composites in one hour with a rubber dam and do it as best you can and best that that's just one hour of bust ass hard work. And if a dental therapist wants to do that, and and, and then the dentist is telling me all this and that, but they, they talk about everything but the patient. And I don't care the top line numerator, dentist, therapist, hygienist. Um, Deniquist, insurance, all those issues, because the, the denominator is the patient. And we have to keep one eye on the patient and one eye on cost, or Americans won't have the freedom to afford to keep their teeth. And it should yeah. all be patient driven. And it just seems like the whole dental agenda is just dentists. It's all about the dentists. It's just they stand in there. Um, singing, you know, me, 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 self, 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 me, me, self, self, me, 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 self, 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 me. And I'm like, it's not about you. Dude, you went to dental school for eight years for the patient. You need to find that spot. Don't you think mobile dentistry uh, allows more access and availability to another section of the market? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, a third of dentists don't even take Medicaid. And so, you know, I've noticed my area in West Louisville will go from 10 practices to two in 20 years. Why do you think the dental offices taking Medicaid have shrank from 10 to two in your lifetime in Louisville? Um, profitability. Um, my, during that same period of time, I went from paying an assistant $6 an hour to $20 an hour. But another thing that drives me crazy about that is they'll say, well, I can't take this Medicaid or or Medicare or PPO because uh, profitability. And then I'll say, okay, well, they're only giving you $100 for a filling and an amalgam will last 38 years. So why are you doing a rubber dam and a direct composite and taking all this time? And so it's like when you tell them you got to switch from a, a Ford Taurus to a Ford Escort, they say, well, I'm still going to do the Ford, es- the Ford Taurus, but I'm only going to get paid for a Ford Escort, and then I'm going to bitch about it. It's like, dude, if I give you $15,000, you can't buy a $30,000 Ford Taurus, so why are you doing 
cosmetic posterior composites. And then when that dentist starts doing amalgams, and he can, so he's profitable doing Medicaid and PPOs and all that stuff, um, then he goes to this dental study club meeting, and everybody's like, oh, see that guy over there? He does amalgams. And it's like, yeah, dude, he treats the poor, and his fillings last twice as long as yours, um, but they, they don't seem to be able to adjust to a lower cost dentistry. I mean, I mean, Kwan, the whole time you've been talking, I haven't seen any of your molars. Um, so why, <laughs> why? Now, there, now I, I just saw some more now, but the bottom line is why does number, why does a second molar, why can a second molar not have an amalgam, which lasts, is made of metal last 38 years. And then people say, well, I don't have enough money to do it. And they're doing a direct composite with a rubber dam that takes half an hour. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think part of it is about giving the patients the same quality of care, regardless of what their insurance uh, dictates. But I agree with you on not bitching about it. You know, if you sign up to help the patients, then, you know, it just no. goes with it. But an amount, but when you talk about quality of care, I mean, my gosh, I mean, imagine um, the, the four teeth that are most likely to be filled, drilled, root canal, extracted, replaced with an implant it is the four six-year molars. And, and, and that's why I don't even believe in sealants because I think the fissures need to be removed. It needs to be a direct occlusal composite or an amalgam at this state um, to stop that whole headwind. And I just think, man, I got um, If every kid in America got four occlusal amalgams when he turns six, no one would see him. No one's ever going to see them. And my God, think of how many root canals, crowns, bridges, extractions, and implants. Just that one little feature. Um, we, we, would do, we would do a lot of things wrong in dentistry. Amalgam lasts longer than composites. And then it, when you have space around your teeth, you have air around your teeth, so you don't have any interproximal decay. So whenever a kid has spaces between all his teeth, we send him to an orthodontist to pull them all together so that we'll make sure there'll be an area without air because we know he won't floss every day, so we spend six thousand dollars to pull them all together, so we'll have a whole bunch of interproximal decay the rest of his life. But uh, um, so so you're using Dedrix Ascend, but are you going to try to put all of this on an, an app? I see that you have um, uh, links to apps on uh, on your website. It's, it's, it's the Care Patient app. Yeah, it's the Care Patient app. Yeah, and and so that's our MVP app. We actually started the company as an application to connect patients to dentists with same day treatment, trying to help build um, the Medicaid access for the Medicaid population. It was a affiliate chair option for doctors in the state of Kentucky. So um, that was how the company actually started. It wasn't actually mobile dentistry. Wow. And so, so how's that going? Oh, so we pivoted and made the application part of the process to pre-register for your appointment. So we take all your medical dental history, all your insurance, um, uh, through the application. And so we've gotten a couple thousand people to download the application in this market and use it to request mobile dental appointments. And part of our expansion is to rework the software so that it can be utilized by providers and patients throughout the country as we expand our licensing opportunities. And um, how, was it been easy programming and development? I mean, is it easy... Uh, to find programmers, or has that been a big challenge? It was, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a dentist. I'm not a programmer. I knew nothing about that that whole process. Um, as I progressed in it over the last two or three years and gotten more acclimated in that that area, I've created relationships with with some bomb programmers that help us uh, create multiple software. We have some other software that we're creating to help with the logistics side of uh, mobile dentistry. So. Uh, we're getting better at it. It was not something that I knew much about, but I've surrounded myself with some good people to help me in that area of the business. It's what I tell every young kid. Um, you know, you always ask them, you know, and I know they hate it, but you always ask them, uh, uh, what do you want to be when you get older? And I always tell them, I said, dude, imagine 1880, 80% of the planet couldn't read. And everybody said they were illiterate. But if you look at from like 1880, to 1950, I mean, that, that was one of humans' greatest, from 1880 to 1980, was had to be one of their finest centuries, so they weren't really illiterate, but they definitely couldn't read or write, and now it's the same thing, it's like 90% of the world um, can't speak any computer language, and the, the kids that learn a computer language, I mean, I've been watching it 
big time since uh, I launched Dental Town in 1999. But the kids that learn any computer language, they just it just opens up so many doors for them. And now you can all the courses you need to learn how to program in any language are all for free on the internet. Um, there's a million places. Um, have you thought about um, learning how to program? Is that going to be I, your next? I, yeah. Definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm in, I just, just because I like to learn, you know, you, you know more about whether you're getting good prices on stuff, the more you know about it. So um, what are the features of your app that um, that you're most excited about? What 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 is your app? Um, like I'm sitting here thinking if, if I asked all my patients to download an app for today's dental, like if I made a today's dental app, um, what should I be thinking about? What what was what's the advantage what surprised you? What did you think they would love and, and it didn't work? The, what, what was the most difficult is um, just getting people to use a free application. Uh, it's, it's harder than you expect unless you tie it to something they really want. So that was the biggest thing that was surprising to me. Um, what they like the most is that it's a way to get in touch with us easier and more efficient. But do you think in the future... Uh, that more dentists will be having app, a personal app for their dental office for all their patients? I think that I've noticed a, a, a larger, I think when I first started my app, it was only like ZocDoc out there. And um, I think that in the age of more touchless appointments, I can see software being a major player. And we're trying to create software now that's going to automate the scheduling process to eliminate some costs especially when it comes to front desk call and call center calls. Are you going to let them um, schedule their own appointment on your, um, on the app? I mean, some dental offices are having online appointment scheduling. That's the plan. Yeah. That yeah. is the plan. Yep. Wow. Um, Kwan, if someone's, is if someone's interested in how, how do they contact either of you for um, these, uh, these uniforms, the, the, uh, the SAM uniforms, how, what, which, how do they contact you uh, for care mobile? What's yeah, the best way to get a hold of you guys? You can go to either one of our websites, um, twice as nice uniforms.com or care mobile. Is that your website? Care. Mobile. Yeah. Care. Yeah. Mobile. Um, -E. yeah. Um, and you can, and there's an 800 number as well. We have customer service people. So, you know, definitely give us a call. The radiation jackets are in production right now. So um, we need to change that on the website. We're not just taking pre-orders anymore. We're taking orders. Um, so they're, they're ready to go. And one thing I wanted to mention, about our lab coats and the radiation protectant jacket in you know these times of COVID now, th these jackets all snap completely closed. So it snaps closed at the neck, you stand your collar up, it snaps closed at the wrist. So you are completely protected um, when you're in either just the regular lab coat or the radiation protectant lab coat as well. Perfect. And then as far as if you're interested in being a licensee or learning more about owning your own compact mobile dental unit, um, you can contact me at kwane at kare dot mobi. Um, send me an email. I uh, would love to chat with you, uh, show you some videos. If you want to come to Kentucky, uh, we're seeing patients still, and you know, spend a day with us and just see the the experience for yourself. Love to have you. Love to see this. Um, as Howard said, I, I think it's important. Access is huge and important, and this is a cost effective way for you to be able to provide it. And, and, you know, the, uh, again, um, when you look at DSOs, they all target the same neighborhood. They want median household incomes above $60,000, and they're all going to the same side of town, and it's only Aspen that sit there and said, well, let's put a removable partial lab for dentures and partials and reliance, and they're targeting the Medicaid population, and in business, you're supposed to go where they ain't. And in Arizona, we got two dental schools, and when they graduate, they all want to go to the richest part of Scottsdale, and there's a dentist on every corner, and they don't realize that those homes are a half acre, and they only have like two people living in them. But when you go to the poorest part of town, an acre with an apartment complex on there might have 400 people in there, and you don't have any competition. And if you say your overhead's too high, well... Why are you doing an empress 
direct composite under a rubber dam with a laser. I mean, when you go to McDonald's, you don't say, hey, where's the tablecloth on my table? And where's the chandelier? And it's a hamburger. And I love their hamburgers. And I think they're quality and healthy and great. And I do know that if you don't know that an amalgam restoration lasts twice as long as an inert plastic restoration. You you drank so much Kool-Aid, I, I don't even know where to begin because I lost you at math, chemistry, physics, and biology. Now you're in some purple Kool-Aid land. Uh, what, what was that guy that used to run through the wall? Remember Mr. Kool-Aid? He'd run through the wall. I mean, you know, you're, you're beyond Mr. Kool-Aid. So um, when you get a lower fee, you don't have to reduce your quality. I mean, I mean, look at tacos. I can go to Taco Bell and get two tacos for a dollar, or I can go next door to Macayo's restaurant and two tacos are seven dollars. They're both tacos, but um, I just love it when dentists are entrepreneurs and you two are flaming entrepreneurs. I love it when people challenge the status quo, and uh, it's so exciting to have both of you guys on Team Dentistry. Uh, thank you so much uh, for all that you're doing for dentistry. Thank you for your entrepreneurship, and it's just been a complete honor to podcast interview you today. Thank you. Thank I you wanted to add that. one more other fun thing that we're doing during COVID is we're doing virtual fashion shows. So if you have a CE or a meeting or something, you want to add a little bit of education and fun along with it, we, we can um, offer those as well. Wow. That's they're, uh they're fun. All right. Well, that's my next job. My next job is I want to be a fashion <laughs> runway model. So all this right. might be my door to start working my way in, but, uh, bring again. your shoes and we'll put you don't, in. <laughs> Howard, don't, don't say that. The first time I met her in DC, she didn't tell me she threw me in the fashion show. I wasn't planning on doing all yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Said, here, put this on and get up on stage. And he did an amazing job. <laughs> all right. Well, it's been an honor to, uh, podcast Sherlock Holmes and Watson, uh, <laughs> for two hours on entrepreneurship dentistry. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It was right, fun.